My name is Sam Vaknin, and I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. Should Israel attack Iran preemptively, will this attack be justified under the norms of international law? In an age of terrorism, guerrilla, and total warfare, the medieval doctrine of just war needs to be redefined. Moreover, issues of legitimacy, efficacy, and morality should not be confused. Legitimacy is conferred by institutions. Not all morally justified wars are therefore automatically legitimate. Frequently the efficient execution of a battle plan involves immoral or even illegal acts. So efficacy, morality, and legitimacy are three completely separate issues. As international law evolves Beyond the ancient facets of sovereignty, it should incorporate new thinking about preemptive strikes, human rights violations as, cause, as casus belli, and the role and standing of international organizations, insurgents, and liberation movements. Yet, inevitably, what constitutes justice depends heavily on the cultural and societal contexts, narratives and mores and values of the disputants. Thus, one cannot answer the deceivingly simple question, is this war a just war, without first asking, according to whom, in which context, by which criteria, based on what values, in which period in history, where. Being members of Western civilization, whether by choice or by default, our understanding of what constitutes a just war is crucially founded on our shifting perceptions of the West itself. Imagine a village of 220 inhabitants, like the 220 nations on Earth. It has one heavily armed police constable, flanked by two lightly equipped assistants. The hamlet is beset by a bunch of ruffians who molest their own families and at times violently lash out at their neighbors. These delinquents mock the authorities and ignore their decisions and decrees. Yet the village council a source of legitimacy, refuses to authorize the constable to apprehend the villains and dispose of them by force of arms if needs be. The elders see no imminent or present danger to their charges and are afraid of potential escalation whose evil outcomes could far outweigh anything the felons can achieve at this stage. Incensed by this laxity and leniency, the constable, backed only by some of the inhabitants, breaks into the home of one of the more egregious thugs and expels or kills him. He claims to have acted preemptively and in self-defense, as the criminal, long in defiance of the law, was planning to attack his representatives. Was the constable right in acting the way he did? On the one hand, he may have saved lives and prevented a conflagration whose consequences no one could have predicted. On the other hand, by ignoring the edicts of the village council and the express will of many of the denizens, the constable has placed himself above the law as its absolute interpreter and enforcer. What is the greater danger? Turning a blind eye to the exploits of outlaws and outcasts, thus rendering them ever more daring and insolent, granting them a kind of immunity? or acting unilaterally to counter such pariahs, thus undermining the communal legal foundations and possibly leading to a chaotic situation of might is right. In other words, when ethics and expedience conflict with legality, which should prevail? Enter the medieval doctrine of just war, justum bellum, or more precisely, jus ad bellum propounded by St. Augustine of Hippo, the 5th century AD, St. Thomas Aquinas, in the 13th century, in his Summa Theologica, Francisco de Vitoria, in the 16th century, Francisco Suarez, also in the 16th century, Hugo Grotius, in his influential tome, Jure Belli a Pazis, on the rights of war and peace, 1625, Samuel uh, Kufendorf, Christian Wolff, and Emmerich de Vatel. Modern thinkers include 
Michael Walter in Just and Unjust Wars, published in 1977, Barry Paskins, and Michael Dockery in The Ethics of War, 1979, Richard Norman in Ethics, Killing in War, 1995, Thomas Nagel in War and Massacre, and Elizabeth Enscombe in War and Murder. According to the Catholic Church's rendition of this theory, set forth by Bishop Wilton D. Gregory of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops in his letter to President Bush on Iraq, dated September 13, 2002, going to war is justified if these conditions are met. The damage inflicted, quoting from the letter, the damage inflicted by the aggressor on the nation or community of nations is lasting, grave and certain. All other means of putting an end to it must have been shown to be impractical or ineffective. There must be serious prospects of success, and the use of arms must not produce evils and disorders graver than the evil to be eliminated. A just war is therefore a last resort. All other peaceful conflict resolution options have been exhausted, having been exhausted. The Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy sums up the doctrine this way. The principles of the justice of war are commonly held to be, one, having just cause, especially and according to the United Nations Charter, exclusively self-defense, two, being formally declared by a proper authority, three, possessing a right intention, four, having a reasonable chance of success, five, the end being proportional to the means used. Yet the evolution of warfare, invention of nuclear weapons, the propagation of total war, the ubiquity of guerrilla and national liberation movements, the emergence of global border hoping terrorist organizations, of totalitarian regimes and rogue or failed states, all these require these principles to be modified by adding a few more tenets. tenets. Six, tenet proposed tenet number six, that the declaring authority is law a lawfully and democratically elected government. And number seven, that the declaration of war reflects the popular will. Additionally, we should extend some of the old medieval criteria. We should extend criteria number three by saying the right intention is to act in just cause. We should extend criteria number four by saying uh, having a reasonable chance of success or a reasonable chance of avoiding an annihilating defeat. And, crit and criterion number five should be extended to say that the outcomes of war are preferable to the outcomes of the preservation of peace. And still, the doctrine of just war conceived in Europe in eras past is fraying at the edges. Rights and corresponding duties are ill-defined and mismatched. What is legal is not always moral, and what is legitimate is not invariably legal. Political realism and quasi-religious idealism sit uncomfortably within the same conceptual framework. Norms are vague and debatable, while customary law is only partially subsumed in the tradition, in treaties, conventions and other instruments, as well as in, in the actual conduct of states. The most contentious issue is, of course, what constitutes just cause? Self-defense, in its narrowest sense, reaction to direct and overwhelming armed aggression, is a justified casus belli. But what about the use of force to deontologically, consequentially, or ethically uh, prevent or ameliorate a slow motion or permanent humanitarian crisis? What if we use force to preempt a clear and present danger of aggression? anticipatory or preemptive self-defense against what Grotius call immediate danger? What about securing a safe environment for urgent and indispensable humanitar humanitarian relief operations? Uh, for instance, in Syria. What about restoring democracy in the attack states, what is currently called regime change? What about restoring public order in the attack states, preventing human rights violations or crimes against humanity or violations of international law by the attack state? What about using force to keep the peace, peacekeeping operations, and enforcing compliance with international or bilateral treaties between aggressor and the aggressor and the attacked state, or the attacked state and a third party? What about suppressing armed infiltration, indirect aggression or civil strife, aided and abetted by the attacked state? 
What about honoring one's obligations to frameworks and treaties of collective self-defense when the attacked state has actually attacked the third party? That happened in World War II. What about protecting one's citizens or the citizens of a third party inside the attacked state? What about protecting one's property or assets owned by a third party inside the attacked state? That happened in, in a variety of circumstances where the United States attacked states in Latin America. What about responding to an invitation by the authorities of the attacked states and with their express consent to militarily intervene within the territory of the attacked state? Is that justified? Or what about reacting to offenses against the nation's honor or its economy and so on and so forth? Unless these issues are resolved, codified, the entire edifice of international law, and more specifically the law of war, is in danger of crumbling. The contemporary multilateral regime proved inadequate and unable to effectively tackle genocide, for instance in Rwanda or Bosnia, terror in Africa, Central Asia, in the Middle East, weapons of mass destruction, Iraq, India, Israel, Pakistan, North Korea, and tyranny in dozens of members of the United Nations. This feebleness inevitably led to the resurgence of might is right unilateralism, as practiced, for instance, by the United States in places as diverse as Grenada, Afghanistan, and Iraq. This pernicious and ominous phenomenon is coupled with contempt towards and suspicion of international organizations, treaties, institutions, undertakings, and the prevailing consensual world order. In a unipolar world, reliant on a single superpower for its security, the abrogation of the rules of the game would lead to chaotic and lethal anarchy with a multitude of rebellions against the emergent American empire. International law, formalism of natural law, is only one of many competing universalist and missionary value systems. Militant Islam is another example. The West must adopt the former to counter the latter.